Hey, thanks for clicking in. Around here, we upload videos each and every week. So make sure you hit that subscribe button for your weekly dose of encouragement. As you're watching this message, you may feel led to get connected to our ministry. Make sure you check out the description box below to find out how to do just that. As you're watching, you may also want to give to our ministry. There are many ways to do so, so utilize what works for you. Thanks for partnering with us. Now, let's check it out. In the text that we will be coming out of today, we will be discussing King Hezekiah. Now, King Hezekiah, a little bit about him before we dig into the text. He knows all too well what it looks like to come from a family that's a little not right. His father was King Ahaz, and he was truly an evil king. But the beautiful thing about King Hezekiah is he truly lived his life for God and in ways to honor God. And then so in our text, we get to come up and see something that ended up devastating Hezekiah. So let's go ahead and dig into the word. It's 2 Kings 20. And it says, In those days... Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Whew, that's deep. For you shall die and not live. And he turned his face toward the wall and he prayed. He prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight, not your friend's sight, not your family's sight, not the community's sight, but in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened. Now say it happened. It happened. That's right. It happened. Before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen, I have seen your tears. And surely, I will heal you. And on the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. How many of y'all are excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Yes. Yes. Let us pray over this word. Father God, we come before you, Lord, humbly, just thanking you, Lord, thanking you for your presence, thanking you for who you are, Lord God. We just pray that your spirit hovers over this ministry today, hovers over those who are watching online, Lord, and allows us to be able to let this word penetrate our hearts in the areas that we need most, Lord, that you and only you can see. And so, Lord, I just pray that you have your way in this place, have your way in this ministry, Lord God. Use me as your vessel. Allow me to fully decrease, Father God, so that you may increase in this place. And Lord, let some healing take place in this house today. It is in Jesus Christ's name we say these things. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated. And so the title of today's message is Set Me Free. Set Me Free. So not long ago, I had to take a trip down to the courthouse. Now, as you guys know, going to the courthouse is not fun ever, unless, of course, you're expecting something positive. But for the most part, it's not fun. But me, I'm always trying to have a positive, a positive disposition, a bubbly disposition. And so as I walked into the courthouse, I was smiling and I smiled at the guards and I said, hello, how are you guys? And they said, it's so great to see a smile. They said, all of the faces in here are always so angry. And then I said, well, I have no reason not to smile. I have no reason not to have a positive disposition. And so as I passed them, I ended up getting to a bailiff who ended up helping me. He was standing outside of the courtroom that I needed to be in. 
And we ended up, uh, he opened the courtroom, we all went and sat down, but it was still a little early, and so I sat down. And he just came over and we just started having a full-blown conversation. And he ended up saying to me, it is so pleasant to be able to speak to someone like you because we're not used to having that here in the courthouse. And then he said, I'm pretty sure you've never really had any difficulties in your life. He said that. He said, I'm pretty sure you've never had any difficulties in your life. And I said, well, I can promise you I have. I can promise you that I've been through the fire, but I refuse to allow myself to smell like the smoke. Amen. I refuse to allow myself to look like what I have been through. And so chances are, Many of you, if not everyone in this room, have been through the fire. You've dealt with the pain of experiencing the ups and the downs of life. If I can be honest, I can still remember the first time that I experienced true pain. And it was when I was eight years old. And so I grew up in a single parent household. And we lived in PG County for pretty much from when I was born up until when I was eight. And then we ended up moving almost an hour away. So everything that I once knew was gone. But not only did we move an hour away, my parental figure basically kind of moved out the house. And this isn't figurative, this is literal. And so my sister and I, we kind of raised ourselves in a way. Now they would come back and forth, you know, um, like I'd see them every couple of months or so. I could always tell they were there because the mail would be gone. But long story short, I learned the pain of what true abandonment felt like. So much so that if I could call and I would say, I miss you, can you come home? I would be told, leave me alone and don't call unless it's an emergency. Now with something like that taking place at such a young age, it really does change you. But it made me strong, it made me independent, probably too independent, y'all. <laughs> but it made me independent. And so much so where when I turned 18, I ended up getting a job because I wanted to make money. I ended up moving out of my house when I was 17 while I was still in high school. And they didn't realize it until I told them three months later, actually. But that was the first time I started to experience what the pain of life could feel like. And there are so many people who are in the Bible who have experienced different types of pain as well throughout their lives. One of my favorite stories is the story of Job. Now, if you guys know the story of Job, he was an amazing man. And he truly put his life before God and did everything for God. And then he ended up getting hit because God had a conversation about him. And he ended up losing everything. He lost his flock, he lost his sheep, he lost his camels, he lost his children. Everything was taken from him. But the beauty of that is everything was taken because God was bragging on his name. And what I love about that story is it reminds us that everything that happens to us doesn't necessarily mean we did something wrong. It could simply be because God is up there bragging on us and bragging on our name and bragging on who we are and what we are about. But he experienced true heartbreak when he went through that because the person that he entrusted to cover him and keep him safe, it seemed like he left him abandoned. But in actuality, he never was abandoned because God was there all along. And so Job was one of the people who experienced true pain. And then there's also Hezekiah, who our message is about today. Now Hezekiah, he had his heart broken when he received the devastating news that he was going to die. Scripture says that he wept bitterly, bitterly. Now bitterly, it means angry. It means angry. And anger is just the reaction to or a distraction from inner suffering that we are experiencing. And so anytime you're around someone that's angry, don't allow it to make you angry as well. Those are opportunities for us to have compassion because that person is hurting somewhere in there. 
But all of us had something in common. Job, Hezekiah, myself, we all had something in common. All we wanted was to be set free. Set free from the pain that we were experiencing. Set free from what was taking place in our lives. Set free from what we did not understand was going on. And I don't know how many people are in this place right now, but there is somebody in here that wants to be set free. The reason why I picked this message for you all today is because I serve at this altar every week. And I see the tears. I see the heartbreak. I see people who need a release. And I wanted everybody to truly know that God is in this place and God wants to set you free from everything that you are experiencing, from the minor to the major, anything that you are going through, God wants to set you free. But that's how Hezekiah felt. He wanted to be set free. And we don't even know how he got sick. It just popped up on the scene that he was sick. But we do know it wasn't due to age. Because when we correlate that main scripture with 2 Kings 18.2, it basically shows he was only 39 years old. 39 years old to be hit with a terminal illness. 39 years old to be told that your life is ready to end. If we put ourselves in that situation, what would you do? What would you do if you were told that everything is getting ready to change? But the beautiful thing about that is God was still graceful enough to tell him to set his house in order. Now, when we have to set our house in order, it's another way of looking at it from the angle of it's time to get our priorities in check. What are the priorities that we may have been lacking on there or that we have put on the back burner that God truly wants us to begin to pay attention to and put first? Because oftentimes in life, we will face a death, whether it's the death of a relationship, a death of a marriage, um, a death of a friendship, a death of a job, a death of a dream. But sometimes those deaths are not meant to kill us, but truly so that we can begin to prioritize God and set our house in order. And so what did Hezekiah do? when he was told this information. What did he do? It says that he turned his face to be with the only one who could heal him. He turned his face to the only one who could set him free. This is our opportunity to see in ourselves what have we been turning to that maybe we should have been turning to God. Who have we been turning to? Who have we been venting to? Who have we been crying to? Instead of turning our face to the only one that can change our situation. Instead of turning our face to the only one who could set us free. Instead of turning our face to the only one who truly knows how we feel and can give us and provide the healing that we need in our lives. The healing that we need in our circumstances. The healing that we need within our bodies. The healing that we need within our minds. The healing that we need in our families, in our homes, in our communities. What have we been turning to? I want you guys to say it with me. There is only one him, only one him who can set me free. Can set me say free. it like you mean it. There is only one him only one that can set me free. There is only one him who covers my life. There is only one him who covers my circumstances and my situation. There is only one him who can bring healing to this place. There is only one him who can help me through everything that I'm going through. There is only one him who can fix my family, who can fix my situation, who can fix my marriage, who can fix any and everything that I am going through. Shout it out. There is only one him. Amen. 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 There is only one him. There is only one him. And as he turned to pray, he pleaded his, clay, his case so that he could be spared. He pleaded his case. He prayed to God. Now, the interesting thing about his prayer is it was perfectly acceptable in the Old Testament scriptures based off of the cultural interpretation, right? He prayed to God saying, God, I have done this. I have been faithful. I have done right what is in your sight. 
And in the Old Testament, he would have been able to claim all of that with an honest heart, an honest, true heart. But for us, we can't, with a clear conscience, pray like that because we know that we haven't been living a righteous life. We know that we have sinned. We know that we fall short daily. But the way that we can pray is because they, we have a Jesus who died on the cross yes. for our sins. Yes. And so when we come before God, we come before God based off of what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. Yes. And so after Hezekiah prayed, God spoke to Isaiah once more to tell Hezekiah three things. I have heard your prayer. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I have seen your tears. And surely, surely, I will heal you. God is saying that every time you get down on your knees, every time you are in that vehicle driving around for hours, every time you whisper even my name, daughter, son, I hear you. I can hear your prayers. I hear everything you say to me. I hear you when you cry out in the middle of the night. I hear you when you cry out for your family and for your friends and for your relationships and for your marriage and for your health. I hear you. And he said, and I've seen your tears. Those tear stained pillows that so many of us have so many nights throughout the week. Those tears that drop to the concrete those tears that drop to the floors, those tears that drop on someone's shoulder when you are crying to them as well. God is saying each and every one of those, I see it, I see it. But y'all come on because then after that he says, but surely, surely, surely I will heal you, surely. You do not have to go through this alone. Surely I will cover you. Surely because he is faithful. There is someone in here who is ready to step into their surely moment. You have been waiting too long. You have been fighting too hard. You have been going through too much. And you are ready for your surely moment. Your surely moment. And God is ready to provide that to you if you are ready to let him in. And so what God was saying was, Hezekiah, I'm going to set you free. Free from this pain. Free from this fear. Free from this heartbreak. And now some of us, we may be looking for physical healing. But for others, it may be something a little bit deeper and it concerns matters of the heart. I don't think I'm alone when I say my heart has been broken. Like I said, I, you know, dealt with the pain at the age of eight of feeling like what abandonment felt like, feeling like I was unworthy of love, feeling like I was alone, feeling like the person who was created to protect me and love me didn't care about me. But that still led to a difficult path. It ended up putting me into physically abusive relationships. It ended up leading me down a road of addiction and professions that can really truly crush your spirit. It led me down such a dark path that I didn't know how to get out of until I finally went to seek the only one who could pull me out, the only one that could help me, the only one that could set me free and set my family free and change our lives for the better, the only one who could make a way out of no way. I got to a place where I said, God, I want you to set me free. And so when we go through these types of heartbreaks, when we go through these types of situations, It leads to vulnerability issues. It leads to trust issues. It leads to unforgiveness, anger, bitterness, resentment, anxiety. There are so many different things. 
But in the same token, in the way that some of us can admit that we are broken and that we need a savior and that we need to be helped, it's the same as those who are unable to accept that they are broken. And whether that's due to shame, whether that's due to guilt, whether that's due to pride, sometimes it's not always as easy to admit that we are truly broken. And when we act like we don't need healing, that's not being healed. That's not putting ourselves in a place to be healed. We have to remember that a hard heart is not a healed heart. A hard heart is not a healed heart. And a hard heart can lead to being unmoved. It can lead to being unresponsive and unfeeling towards God's word, God's mercies, God's promises, and his blessings. And sometimes what happens is we condition ourselves to say, I'm good, to say, I'm, I don't need anything, I'm okay. But truly inside we are broken and we need God. But the only way that we can get the release that we need is to be vulnerable enough to say, God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready for my Shirley moment. God, I'm ready to be set free. There's a, a scripture with Matthew 13. It says, for the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and they have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Wait a minute, so are you telling me that we actually have to let God heal us? We have to take a part in this and open ourselves to God because truly he can heal us. We know that for a fact, he is God. But we have to do this thing together. We have to want it, we have to be open to it. And when he says, and so their eyes cannot see, that means when you have a hard heart, you're not able to receive the vision for your life. You're not able to receive where God is trying to take you, see what God wants you to see. And you cannot hear his word. You cannot hear what he is trying to get through you. And your heart can't understand. Now, a gift that God has granted all of us in our relationship with him is the ability to be honest with ourselves and him. And when we are honest with ourselves and him, we are able to let him in so that we can receive what we need. And the same way that God saved Hezekiah is the same way that he wants to save each and every one of us. His word says, and the truth will set you free. God wants to set us free from anything that is holding us back from the promises that he has, anything that is holding us back from the life that he has, anything that is holding us back from reaping what he has already placed in this earth for us to receive. Because there is so much that he wants to do in us and through us, but we have to open ourselves to him and allow him to come in so that he can work with us and do everything that he is trying to do. But the question is, do we really want it? Do we really want it? There's the story um, in John, and I love this story, and I've used it before, but it's the man at the healing waters. And Jesus walks up to him and he says, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? And I remember the very first message I ever taught as a midweek, I used this, this story. Because the interesting thing about it is the man was right by the healing waters. But he told Jesus, well, every time I try to get up, someone gets in front of me. And plus, nobody is here to help me. But the thing is, is Jesus asked him that question because I wondered why would he ask him that? If clearly, clearly he needed healing. Jesus asked him that because his actions were not aligning with what he was saying he wanted. His actions were not aligning with what he was saying he needed. He was giving excuses when God is saying, all you got to do is just walk towards it and get up. you got to push them people to the side. Do what you need to do to go after the healing that I have for you. 
Does our lives reflect everything that we are asking God for? If we are saying we want to be set free, are we still going to the same places that once held us in bondage? Are we still doing the same things that once held us in bondage? Are we still talking to the same people that once held us in bondage? Does our life reflect that we are truly ready to be set free? And the healing that he wanted was right there, but he never moved towards it. I have a, a, feel, a family member and something very devastating happened to them in their late teens. And the thing is, is this was originally a person that I looked up to so much. Hair was always on fleek. Outfits were always looking great. They had great friends, everything. And you know, we've all had someone in our lives like that where you look at them, you say, yeah, I wanna shoot towards that. But something happened to them in their late teens and it changed the trajectory of the rest of their lives. And they were never, ever the same. They literally haven't been right since what took place. And sometimes if we hold on to the pain of what took place, if we hold on to the poison of what that moment did, we can never truly move forward, move towards what God is trying to do in our lives. How many of you guys have seen or experienced this? You haven't been right since the relationship ended. You haven't been right since the accident. You haven't been right since the diagnosis. You haven't been right since they said that to you or this to you. You haven't been right since this took place. Do we have a haven't been right situation? And have we allowed ourselves to stay stuck in it instead of move towards what God truly wants to do in our lives and through us? We have the ability to move towards our healing. And if we aren't careful, holding on to the pain that can hinder us from going can leave us stagnant in our healing process. Because you see, God never intends to hurt us. He never intends to hurt us although he understands that it's a part of the process to be used for the purpose and the plans that he has for us. He is a refiner. Do you have a haven't been right since? I was uh, thinking about this, uh, uh, an analogy that I heard not long ago, and it was saying how there's only two people that will come at you with a knife. There's one person who's trying to assault you and there's one person who's trying to cut you open to heal you, a doctor. And we have to always keep in the forefront of our minds that when God is in the center of it, when God is a part of it, he's only trying to help us and heal us. Even though we're going to have to go through the pain of the healing process to get to our finish line and where he is trying to take us. And the enemy's plan, it's not just to simply to keep us from having God's blessings in our lives. He's trying to keep us from truly being free. It's all about hijacking our attention to keep us distracted from what God has for us. Really think about it. If every single person in this room, if we all lived to our fullest potential, can you imagine how quickly we could change this city? Can you imagine how quickly we could change this state? Can you imagine how unstoppable we would all be? It would be amazing. But sometimes we all, and myself included, can get distracted. We can get distracted. Addiction is not about addiction. It's about distraction. Loneliness is not about loneliness. It's just a distraction. Think about it. If you ate a whole bunch of cupcakes, and then you were supposed to go out for a steak. You're not going to be hungry for the steak because you have allowed yourself to be filled up on things that are not going to help you, filled up on <laughs> junk, filled up on things that are taking up nothing but space, and then you are unable to receive the fullness of what you are truly trying to receive and need to receive. When we do that, when we fill up on cupcakes, it keeps us from being filled up on God and God alone. And all it is, is just a distraction. A distraction what God is truly trying to provide for us to give us the substance that we need to continue to move forward in our lives. Satan wants to distract us from a love that has no bounds, from a healing that has no bounds, from a future 
that has no bounds, from opportunities that have no bounds. And we have the opportunity to make sure that that does not happen ever again. And we do this every time we take our burdens to the throne of God and instead we grab a hold of the thoughts and the things planted by the enemy. Instead of taking hold of what the enemy is trying to do and what the enemy is trying to distract us with, if we take our pain, if we take our situations that we go through to the throne of God, we will truly receive what we need because we're giving it all to God. There's a scripture that I wanted to read. It's Hebrews 4.14, but I want to read the message version because it's so plain. It says, now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, experienced it all, but sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Take the mercy, accept the help. Open up and let God in. Open up and let God change your circumstances. Open up and let God change your life. Open up and show God that you trust him with every single thing that you are going through in this life. And you know he will make a way out of no way. And you know that he has plans and a purpose for your future and for your life. But we have to open up and allow God to come in. I dare you guys to praise him in this moment right now for a great God, for a God who will continue to be there through everything that we go through. Yes. Yes. Open up and let him in. Now, when we give it to God, when we take it to the throne of God and give it to God, it's truly allowing him to take over that process and allowing him to take over those situations and those circumstances. I remember when I first started hearing the term, give it to God, give it to God, give it to God. And then I went through many, many years, but I still always kind of wondered, if I could be honest, what that looked like. Because it's not some tangible thing that you're gonna toss up. And then I hit a situation where I, where I had to experience it for the first time. What happened was this was during COVID right in the beginning. And so, you know, it was when everything was locked down. Okay. You couldn't go nowhere, couldn't do anything. And I had to prepare to teach a Bible study. And it was still in the beginning when I first started teaching. So it was only my second or third one. So of course my nerves were all over the place, you know, and I just wasn't, I just, you know, I was scared if I could be honest. And I'll never forget, I was going over my notes and then I received a random email. And the email said that we needed to move in a couple of weeks. And so of course I was like, this ain't nothing but the devil. And I was scared and I called them and I said, what is going on? What is going on? And they explained that the owner of the condo decided that she wanted to go ahead and offload the condo since it was a seller's market. And I said, but you're only giving me a couple weeks notice. You know, we need more time. I have a whole family. And she said, no, we, we sent you an email quite some time ago. And I said, no, I never received anything. And she said, well, let me look. And she pauses for a couple seconds and she said, oh, it's in my drafts. I didn't click send. And I was like, okay. And so I got off the phone with her and I lost it. I started crying because now I got to move me and my children last minute. Everything's closed. How are we going to find something? It was just a horrible situation. And on top of that, I was preparing to be on stage in three hours. And I just remember I said, no, I'm not doing this. And y'all, I started worshiping our God. I started singing songs of praise. I started telling him how faithful he was, how loving he was, how I was trusting him with my situation and my circumstances. 
And then after I worshiped him for a while, I just began to pray. I began to pray. And then I started looking over my notes and it showed, I got to a part where I actually started talking about rest, resting in God. And I felt like the spirit was saying, I want you to rest. And I was kind of scared. I was like, I can't take a nap. Um, but I did, I actually set my alarm and I took a nap because I, I, I feel like I truly needed that reset. And so I took a nap and I woke up and as soon as I woke up, that was the first thing that popped in my mind. And I said, no, nope, we're not doing this. This is God's problem. This ain't my problem. I'm not looking at it. I'm not dealing with it. I'm not worrying about it. As far as I'm concerned, it didn't even happen. And I got up here and I, I taught a word that I pray that bless somebody. And then after that, I let God do what he needed to do because again, it was his problem. That's what it truly looks like to go to the throne and give it to God. It's when you put it off and you say, you know what, God, this is your situation. This is your family. These are your kids. This is your job. You're going to handle this. And I'm just going to walk in my purpose and the calling that you have placed on my life. He has to be in these situations with us. I like to liken it to, say, a football game or a soccer game. If we're on the field and we're playing the best way that we can, how are we going to ever pass the ball to God if we have him as an innocent bystander on the side? We want to be able to keep him in the game of life with us at all times because we never know when something is going to go awry. We never know when the tides and the waves are going to shift. But if we keep him front and center in this game of life with us, we can always pass the ball to him and say, go ahead, you go ahead and win this game. Because I can promise you, he is a victorious God and he will do what he promises he will do. And so what does it look like to stay? What are some ways that God uses to truly heal us from our pain? I didn't want to open any wounds without actually giving steps and information on different things that we could do to be able to truly begin our healing processes. Well, one way that God uses to heal us is by our posture. And that's having a posture of vulnerability. If we can be honest, how many of us struggle with vulnerability, right? It makes you feel open. It makes you feel dirty. It's hard to really, truly trust and open up. And I would say majority of this room may, and myself included, because it's not easy. But why is that? It's because it's difficult. It's because that means we have to have faith. It means that we are open. If you think about an open door, anything can come through it, good or bad. But when we keep that vulnerability door closed, we know nothing's going to get through the good or the bad. Now, we may keep it closed because we don't want to feel that bad. But when it's not open, we're not receiving the good to come through the doors as well. Brene Brown, she describes vulnerability as the core of shame and fear in our struggle for worthiness. But it is also, y'all check this, it is also the birthplace of joy, creativity, belonging, and love. Our ability to admit to God that we are hurting and broken in the first place is what can lead to healing in the birthplace that Brene talks about. First Peter 5, 6, it says this, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Our due time is always up to God, but we still have to take part by casting all our care on him. And healing can't take place unless we are able to truly admit that we need that healing, that we need to feel God in those places. Second Kings 25, our main verse, it says, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. 
I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. All of the care that we are placing on God, God sees it all and he hears it all. So nothing ever lands on bad ground with God. He takes it all in. And no matter how bad a situation is, we can honestly always take it to God. And whatever posture we have is what will be our make and break point to receive what we need. But our posture, we want to make sure we're keeping it inclined. There's the scripture, Psalm 119, 112, and it says, I have inclined my heart to perform your statues forever to the very end. Now, to incline your heart must mean at some point it may have been declined. And sometimes we may be tempted to decline in a default position, whether it's decline into depression, decline into addiction, de decline into loneliness. Like I mentioned before with the family member, they ended up declining into a default position. But when we choose to incline our hearts to live for God and trust his ways and his processes, we will always receive what we seek. I want you guys to shout it out. Take it to God. Take it to God. Take it to God. Amen. The next way that God heals us is through pardon. Pardon. And this is another way of saying forgiveness. And when we don't pardon someone, it breeds bitterness. It breeds resentment prolonged anger and all of this only further harms our walk our growth and our progress we are called to forgive just as we have been forgiven and that is not only forgiving others for what they may have done but it's also forgiving ourselves i think sometimes we can be our own worst critic i know i am and sometimes it can be harder for us to forgive ourselves for mistakes that we have made than to forgive others for mistakes or trespasses that they have made against us. Jesus kind of talks about this in the parable of the unforgiving servant. It's in Matthew 18. And what happens is, is there was a man and he wanted his servants to go and clear up his accounts for those who owed him money. And there was one servant who owed him money and he fell down and he apologized and he said, I'm so sorry, I'll pay everything. Give me another chance. And so the man took pity on him. But then that servant went to his servant who owed him money and demanded his money. And when that servant apologized and laid down at his feet, he put his hands on him and then he threw him in jail. And so the other servants went and told the man what this servant that he had forgiven had done. And this man ended up having him thrown in jail. And it says that he was tormented. This shows us how mercy is a precondition for forgiveness. But the same way that we are forgiven is the same way that we are supposed to forgive others who trespass against us. In our hearts, it's forgiving others and forgiving ourselves. But also in that story, what I love about it is it allows us the opportunity to see how important it is for God's justice to prevail. You see, the servant ended up taking everything into his own hands and hurting that man and having him thrown in jail versus having mercy on him. He tried to give his own justice in that way. But it's not for us to avenge ourselves. It's not for us to seek our own justice because we have a God that has already promised to fight all of our battles. We have a God that is already victorious in every single thing that he has done for us in our lives. And if we allow him to fight our battles, there is no telling how we will still prosper in the end. And so... In Romans 12, 19, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There is a way that God can work where he can do 10 times better than what we can do ourselves when it comes to our enemies. Amen. But all we have to do is just continue to love, continue to show grace, continue to show mercy and allow God to do the rest. We want to let God take it from here. But I want to be very, very clear about something. And I think this is really important to mention because we talk about the importance of forgiveness, but forgiveness does not have to mean reconciliation. I have seen people who they understand that they have to forgive, but they allow themselves to go back to toxic situations, to toxic marriages, to toxic relationships, to toxic jobs. No, that's not what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is for yourself. Reconciliation is for both parties. And so you can still forgive someone who is toxic. You just don't have to reconcile with them. It's really, really big to be able to point that out. Now, one thing that I did want to mention is the importance of remembering when we hold on to the poison of what these moments did to us, of the ways that people have hurt us, of the things that we have been through. We block all of the beautiful things that God is trying to do in us and through us. We won't be able to appreciate the blessings that he has already placed in our lives. There's the story of uh, Naomi and Ruth. And Naomi, he, uh, she wanted her name to be changed to Mara, which means bitter. Now, the interesting thing about that is because she said she felt as though God had dealt bitterly with her. But she didn't realize she was in a harvest season. She didn't realize that God had allowed her to receive somebody who was going to be faithful to her and be with her. And sometimes in our lives, we can look at the negative of what's taking place and everything that's falling down and not be able to see those little blessings along the way that God is showing us that he still is faithful and he is still there for us. And so we always want to look for the little blessings along the way. And this allows us to stop holding on to the pain of yesterday, stop holding on to the pain of what was, stop holding on to the pain of what could have been, and focus on God and what he is doing in that moment. And so another way that God heals us is through purpose. Purpose. Now, God healed Hezekiah for a purpose. Remember, it says, I want you to go up to the church. It was for God's own sake. In these moments, we have the opportunity to look at our lives and say, how will I advance God's kingdom if he sets me free? How will I advance his agenda if he sets me free? How will I advance his people if he sets me free? Because there are things that each and every single one of us have been called to do in this world and in this life. We all have a purpose and a plan and a calling on our lives that God has placed on us. But the reasons that he will help us through is when we show him that it is all going to be used for his glory and his glory alone. I know each and every person in here has a purpose. And I know that when you lean on him, He will turn any situation around. God can turn your brokenness into beauty. He can turn your pain into purpose. He can turn your fear into faith. He can turn your failure into fruit. God can change every single thing that you look at as a negative and make it so beautiful in a way, in a way that you can only, only give him glory for it. Because that's what he is after and that's what he deserves. And so our final point for this today, I got ready to say this evening, is God heals through presence. No matter how heartbroken we are, God promises that we are never alone. We are never alone. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. 
and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Now with this one, I want to read the message version real quick too, because I really want it to hit home. It says, if your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. Have you ever been kicked in the gut in a way where it takes your breath away? God is here to help us catch our breath. God is here to help us breathe. Have you ever had a moment where you just needed to breathe? That's what God wants to do for us. And when we can quiet our minds and block out everything that is going crazy, we can find healing in knowing that simply God is right there with us in our storms. And the more that we accept God and his presence into our heart, into our circumstances, and believe that his presence is more than enough, we will find hope despite anything, anything that we have lost on this side of eternity. Anything that we have lost. And so in closing, um, there is a book that the leadership team that we've been reading and it's by John Maxwell. We love John Maxwell. He's amazing. And it's called High Road Leadership. It's an amazing, amazing book. And there's a chapter, chapter six. It's on emotional capacity. And what I loved about it is it really hit me in a different way. There is a question that he asks in that chapter. And it says, do you have issues you could address, but instead have accepted and become comfortable with? And then he goes on to say, don't rationalize or defend why you must live with these issues. Don't complain about what you permit. Instead, do something about it. And y'all, that hit me. That hit me. And then lastly, he said, it is more effective to act your way into feeling than feel your way into action. And that was truly mind blowing for me because how often do we maybe not realize it, but we're acting off of emotion, right? We're acting off of how we feel. He's saying, "Uh uh-uh, allow your actions to dictate how you feel. If you feel depressed, sing. If you feel sad, laugh. If you feel fear, plunge ahead. If you feel incompetent, remember past successes. Today, you can become the master of your emotions because the key to dealing positively with negative emotions is to take action. And so in this moment, what comes to mind? What comes to mind? It could be minor, it could be major, because our lives are so broad in what we go through. Hezekiah got another shot, and today God is saying, you have one too. You don't have to hold on to the pain of what took place, what was said, what was done, or the emotions that you once lived with. I wanna set you free. But the final question is, is do you want it for yourself as much as he wants it for you? And in final closing, I have this picture of when I started serving here. It was actually a little after. Now, I was coming out of addiction in that picture. I was struggling. Y'all, I was fighting for my life. But I made sure it doesn't matter what time I finally got to bed, I was at this church serving God. Because even though I didn't love myself as much as I should have, my why was them babies. And that girl would have never thought that she would one day become God's spokesperson. And so I encourage you all, 
Don't allow anyone to tell you that you are not worthy, not even yourself. Allow yourself to stop the self-sabotaging thoughts, the things that people say. Because you truly, 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 really do have a purpose on this world and in this place. There is so much that God wants to do through each and every one of you. You are powerful. You are a force to be reckoned with. And God wants to use each and every one of you. But will you let him? Will you fight through the pains that you go through to become all that he has called you to be? Would you push away all of the naysayers, even your own thoughts and as you as a naysayer, and say, God, I am yours. God, I am ready. God, I may not understand. God, I may be scared. God, I may be worried. God, I may not even fully grasp what you're trying to do. But whatever it is, I want you to use me. I want you to use my family. Them little babies right there are running that camera and another camera. Your growth, your growth is not just for you. Your growth is gonna help generations know how powerful God is, know how wonderful God is, know how loving God is. But the question is, Will you let him use you?